What Do My Neighbor's Apartment and Dongo Adventure, a $1.2.5D platformer published on the Nintendo eShop in 2020, have in common? Well, they both cost more than they're worth, and they both reek of harbored rats. Dongo is a game you're already familiar with if you've ever toggled the price lowest to high filter on the Switch store. Something about its page though, the crusty art style, the weird title, the fact that every screenshot shows the rat in the same pose, something about the horrid first impression its storefront page gives off piqued my interest. And as a YouTuber cursed to play stinky garbage games the rest of my life, no doubt by a shadowy hooded figure eventually revealed to be my evil alter ego, you know I had to dive right in. Even the game's description box, the one space left the developers had to sell me on the experience of whatever the heck Dongo Adventure is supposed to be, even it serves no other purpose than to expose the developers' utter incompetence. Dongo Adventure is a 3D platform style game. Uh, no it's not. This is clearly a 2.5D platformer. Where did these guys go to school? Stupid Town? Where the main character, Dongo, a mouse, ventures through various scenarios – sewer, house, lake, factory, etc. Hold up, these are actually just four of the five levels in the game, so that etc seems to be parked here illegally. Wanna guess what that fifth level is? Garbage. Literal garbage. <laughs> I couldn't even make this up. He carries a backpack equipped with cheese that he uses to throw and defend himself from enemies, besides being able to push objects that help him pass obstacles and solve puzzles. <laughs> Christ, is this a case study in ambiguity? Let's break this down. So, he carries a backpack that has cheese in it, and he uses this to throw and defend himself from enemies. Wait, what is he throwing and defending? Himself? Oh no, okay, so he throws the cheese and defends himself. Or maybe he throws the backpack and defends himself? Ugh, I don't know. And besides being able to push objects? Besides what? He carries a backpack besides pushing objects, or he carries a backpack with cheese. This cheese, he can either use it for throwing and defending himself, or being able to push objects. Or do the cheese in the backpack have nothing to do with him being able to push objects? <laughs> Look, I've already given myself a headache trying to figure this out. Oh, or maybe that's diarrhea. Speaking of diarrhea, this game looks like diarrhea. I mean, let's stop beating around the bush. Dongo Adventure is a $1 piece of shovelware that barely works. It looks like it was baked in a PS1 and sounds like it was drowned in a river. Just listen to this music! <laughs> The game consists of just five levels, and each is terrible in its own way. The physics are ass, it's never easy to tell when you'll collide with things. The game's cruddy visuals and frequent culling errors make it hard to tell which platforms are legit and which are in the background. Surfaces are laid out in ways that make them almost impossible to navigate with Dongo's weighty jump. Every single piece of geometry is an opportunity for this little mouse to get snagged, and mashing the jump button to build up enough momentum to break free of an object you're clipping into feels like slogging through mud. In some situations, like the plants in the kitchen, it almost feels like an exploit, as if this isn't the intended way to clear this obstacle. Enemy hitboxes aren't clear either, meaning you often take damage unfairly from things you either couldn't see or things you couldn't have expected to have such a long reach. Paired with poor level design and enemy placement, some areas are impossible to pass without sacrificing one of Dongo's meager three hits. At one point in the lake level, they throw in piranhas that jump out of the water. Okay. But then another one pops out of this tiny little puddle. <laughs> How in the hell was I supposed to see that coming? Or here, there is no way to jump between these two caterpillars without taking damage. Freaking dum-dums over here, just move these a little bit apart. Speaking of things you can barely see, most of the levels. For whatever freaking reason, they decided to include set dressing that obstructs your view of the game you're begrudgingly trying to play. These foreground elements mask already poorly defined enemy models, meaning you tank even more unfair hits, and sometimes even are technically enemies themselves, like cars that come out of nowhere with zero freaking telegraphing. For the entirety of the last level, a chain link fence sits between you and Dongo, which, due to everything being dull and grey, perfectly conceals the buzz saws you're supposed to be jumping over. But that's not all. Even without a foreground blocking your view, the developers managed to hide critical parts of the level from sight. Without an ability to move the camera either up or down, like most 2D platformers, Dongo's Adventure's crappy level design forces you, on multiple occasions, to take leaps of freaking faith. Your destination hidden off screen. Now, as you'll remember, two of the game's poorly advertised features were Dongo's ability to throw cheese and push blocks. As far as the cheese goes, would it surprise you to know that, one, it's useless as most ground-based enemies are either too low for the cheese to hit, and most flying enemies need to be bounced off to proceed through stages, and two, that it's only actually required in the last level of the game? And <laughs> what a use it has. 
You only have to use the cheese in exactly one part of the factory stage, to press a faraway button that activates a moving platform. But the issue is that Donger... But the issue is that Dongo either throws his cheese before his jump, or at the peak of his jump, neither of which align with the height of the button. So to get through this part, you need to, pardon the pun, cheese the game by repeatedly throwing cheese until you manage to trigger the cheese throw before jumping and get it at just the right height to hit the switch. Oh, and you have a limited amount of cheese, so you have to do all this under the pressure of possibly soft-locking yourself here. Then there's pushing blocks, the other thing we're told from the get-go that Dongo is apparently good at. If only our world's actual laws of nature were carried into Dongo's. Alas. Not only do the block physics not work, but the game designers have no idea how to design puzzles around them. One of the first pushable blocks you encounter is in the first level. You reach it after killing a cockroach and then passing over it to the stage's first checkpoint. The trick here is that after unlocking the checkpoint, you need to push the block backwards and then use it as a ramp to mount a previously unreachable pipe. Problem is, as you inevitably die later and are respawned at the checkpoint, so is the cockroach. The cockroach who, despite it not being advertised, has Dongo's same ability to push blocks. Uh-oh, looks like we've got ourselves a bit of a standoff. The solution, of course, is for you to wait for the bug to push the block far enough for you to jump over and kill it, but holy hell, what a waste of time and what bad placement. And on top of all of this straight-up broken garbage, the game has the audacity to, when it does function, manage to be genuinely difficult. No, a game that looks this bad should have no right to ask you to do precision platforming and perfectly timed jumps off fragile little enemies in a second fucking level. Dongo, man, take a note from another dong. Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong teaches us to leave that stuff to advanced players who want to go for collectibles or whatever. Don't make difficult parts like that part of the level's main path. These dumbass Dongo dipshit devs, man, what were they thinking? <sighs> Overall, this game is a big pile of dookie. That's why I give it a score of a rat's prolapsed anus out of 10. <laughs>
For instance, I loved my time with Sable, but it would be a lie to say that the trance it put me under wasn't often broken due to the game's technical instability. Throughout my playthrough, I had to restart many times due to some critical item not loading in, each time causing me to lose out on the experience the game was trying to give me, yet, given the game's scope, also leave me wondering for longer than necessary whether the lack of anything interactable in seemingly important areas was deliberate or not. Every bug I encountered reminded me that I wasn't in another world. I was sitting at my desk running a fallible executable, and Sable being as immersive and delicate as it is meant some of the game's biggest moments were lost on me for no fault of my own, rather due to its lack of quality, purely in like a, like a software testing sense. Another example is Catch and Release, a VR fishing simulator I tried getting into on the promise of just chilling out on a lake. A problem? Its navigation controls don't work as expected, at least not as I expected. When you paddle the boat, physically of course, barely any of your momentum is preserved, so steering your canoe feels like scraping its bottom against sandpaper. You need to over-exaggerate your movements to get this thing to budge, making the navigation as frustrating as it is literally exhausting. Also, I was told I could come here to relax. Uh, why does the radio only play Christian rock? I don't know if I can actually play this without risking uh, having this whole video flagged for uh, copyright infringement, but trust me when I say, so, so there's an actual radio on the boat that you can operate, you can move the dials and everything, you control the volume, and, and there are various radio stations, and as far as I am aware, every single radio station is a is a Christian rock radio station. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I guess this isn't just a, a VR fishing game, it's a Christian VR fishing game, whatever the hell that means. But when I play Dongo Adventure and encounter its many, many issues, I don't think that way. Yes, this is a precision platformer and its character isn't the most intuitive thing in the world to control, and this rat bastard clips to everything, but are the levels he inhabits fun, creative, and challenging? Yes. And most importantly, does the game's volatility burden its difficulty? Here's the headline. No. If anything, the bugs complement the challenge. Bugginess is hard to discuss because it's not always a pure downside. I mean, would anyone have cared about big rigs if they didn't forget to cap the backward speed limit? <laughs> no. The point is, people think bugs are fun. Or maybe it's better said, bugs are fun to play with. In some instances, they become core parts of the game and enhance it. Hold on! <laughs> In fact, these days, bugginess, particularly graphical kinds, are their own aesthetic. Players flock to objectively and deliberately bad-looking games for their style, and developers are inspired both by PS1 nostalgia and other games to try it out for themselves. I might be biased, and I'll admit to not having fully looked into this trend, but based on my own observations, a lot of games in this style tend to come from places like Japan or Eastern Europe. For whatever reason, we expect this from developers from these regions, and rather than shit on these games for looking broken at face value, we allow ourselves to be rightfully convinced that this style is a choice, not an error. By we, of course I mean you, presumably a North American white guy who's maybe got a couple of hours of Japanese in the Duolingo bank despite living somewhere where maybe other languages spoken by minority populations nearer to you might be more useful for you to know. No shade, no shade. It's okay, you don't want to commit to helping improve the lives of your neighbors, you just want to watch anime, that's fine, no shade, no shade. It's not hard to imagine someone with a familiarity and adoration of Japanese media and culture being more willing to look past the blemishes through to the intent and design of a game released in the exact same state as Dongo if that game were Japanese rather than Brazilian. In fact, it's very easy to imagine if this hypothetical person also happens to already have a general disregard for Latin American culture due to a familiarity and belief in Latin American stereotypes. Talking that fucking stupid Spanish around here speaking when everybody Spanish. else is fucking English speaking uh, American. And I'm obviously not saying that's good or right. Again, please keep in mind that I'm, I'm not from the United States, and a lot of this is me trying to extend my contact with Anglos who regard French Canadians as second-class citizens to the dynamics between USA Americans and Latin Americans, and hoping they're close enough. La différence québécoise est perçue comme potentiellement violente et agressante. On va toujours être là pour défendre la liberté d'expression, mais je pense que euh, ça va faire le Québec bashing. Based on the sort of news that comes out of my southern neighbor, I, I don't think I'm too far off. The impression I get is that it's a very similar relationship, although much more extreme. If you, wa you want to keep speaking French, go back to your Mexican Yes, my man. I'm not Mexican. Still, though, I'm just trying to wrap my head around something. If most players agree that graphical glitches can enhance the visual element of a game's presentation, 
why isn't it fair to say that mechanical bugs can enhance the difficulty of a game's interactive component? The layer of multimedia projects such as games we call gameplay. Unlike other games like Sable, Closing Shift, or fucking Real Fish Money where bugs do impact your ability to enjoy what the game wants you to enjoy about it, Dongo's bugs don't. Bugs that make a game harder to play don't really matter in a game that's already clearly trying to be tough as all fuck. To me, the headline on any coverage about Dongo Adventure should be the difficulty. That comes first. The game's difficulty is supported both by elements of it that work and don't work. <laughs> the bugginess does not detract from it. YouTubers shouldn't be out here saying, oh, I can't believe Nintendo let this make it onto the eShop. They should be saying, holy hell, this is a hard game. If you beat it, you must be a hardcore gamer. Dongo Adventure is the Dong Souls of 2.5D platformers. Even in as objectively a broken state as some of it is, the developer's intent shines through. Can't say that for all buggy games I've played. Despite being troubled by vibe-ruining flaws of arguably greater severity with respect to those vibes than Dongo's, nobody would call Sable nasty, stinky shovelware. I've seen games from elsewhere in the world, games just as broken as Dongo, receive critical acclaim. So, other than where it's from, what's the difference? Well, that's just the thing. Other than where it's from, I don't actually think anything differentiates Dongo from the average glitchy indie game. One hurdle I don't think this little rat can clear on his own is that he doesn't speak English, and it shows. I am willing to bet that the reason most players see Dongo's brokenness differently than they do other games comes down to their social biases, their subconscious alignment with the myth of comprehensibility, and the game's first impression, the description on its store page. The myth of comprehensibility is the idea that most English mother tongue speakers hold biases against others for their accents and lower proficiencies in the language. The myth is often tied to, or in worst cases leads to, linguistic discrimination. In some countries, the United States for instance, your level of English is a form of social currency, where languages and manners of speaking foreign to the English or, or cultural norm are considered silly or uncivilized. Monolingual Anglophones, upon hearing someone speak imperfect English, tend to form unfounded assumptions about their cognitive abilities. Status is attached to English that sounds like it comes from comparably wealthy monolingual countries. For instance, Pakistan and Canada may be similar in that English is just one of both of their official languages, but as Canadian English sounds more American than Pakistani English, a Canadian English speaker will receive less judgment, if any at all. It's really funny because in reality the bias should be reversible. People who operate at different levels of proficiency in different languages should be able to judge monolingual English people's inability to parse their meaning as lazy and dumb themselves. If you speak English so well, why do you need someone else's English to be good enough for you to understand it, dumbass? You're really going to assume someone who speaks multiple languages is dumb because of your inability to speak to them in any of theirs? You're the one who can only be spoken to in one language, you're the weak link here. In Canada, the myth of comprehensibility often manifests itself as anti-Quebecois sentiment. Due to a lack of English language social credit, French Canadians are assumed to be, on a whole, unintelligent and poor. Anglos sometimes refer to Quebecois as Pepsis, marking them lower quality or lower class Canadians, just as Pepsi is to Coke in terms of carbonated beverages. Yet, Quebec was the first province to allow same-sex unions, the first province to decriminalize abortion and open clinics, and the only province where the state subsidizes almost the entirety of university tuition, save for less than two grand you owe per term, less than half the national average. The truth is, Quebec is not only exceptionally progressive and competent as far as Canadian provinces go, it's arguably one of the most successful social welfare states in the world. This status unfortunately doesn't make it through the language barrier, though. And, and that's without even mentioning the province is almost entirely powered by renewable energy. Fuck. If Quebec is Pepsi, <laughs> the rest of Canada is fucking diet sprite. Yet, every couple of years when an election is called, the rest of the country's monolingual population's only window into Quebec is through politicians who unfortunately can't express themselves very well in English debates, leading to unfounded assumptions on their competency and misunderstandings about the values of the province as a whole. They were talking about education, I think so? And build school, because schools are so, you know, not that very is, good. That is all the time we have, but I think we understood oh. what you were saying. and reinvestment. Thank you very much. Switch to the French debates though, and the tables are turned. Suddenly, the other party leaders struggle to get their points across in a language spoken by almost a quarter of the country's population. Or much worse. 
Chers amis, nous les conservateurs ne voudrions pas de cette élection, mais nous allons tout de même remporter cette élection. En voulez-vous des élections? Une élection qui coûte des centaines de millions de dollars. Êtes-vous tenu d'avoir des élections à répétition? Oui! Une cinquième élection avant même que la quatrième soit terminée. Combien ça coûte une élection? But despite this, every election season, the people of Quebec put up with Canadian leaders who sound like bumbling morons in French because they know from experience that nobody's competency should be judged purely in their second language. As they know, people's meaning and intentions don't make it easily across a language barrier. Unless Stephen Harper really was hard on stage the whole time. So when it comes to the states, as an outsider looking in, I can't help but notice that the way Dongo Adventure is publicly perceived is not very different from the way I often see Americans responding to bad English, particularly when spoken by those from Latin America. One of my biggest windows into American culture is TikTok, and one thing I've noticed there a lot, right, is that non-English, and, and particularly Latin American creators, are disproportionately targeted by cringe collectors. The nature of TikTok, though, lends that any video you see is likely not the original source and instead derivative of some other. So why is it always non-English speakers who get picked on? Well, as someone who is generally to moderately proficient in a couple of languages, I know that TikTok will not serve you content unless they can reasonably assume you'll understand it. The amount of English, French, and Greek content I receive is just about proportional to my understanding of each, meaning, when it comes to popular non-English creators, the content of theirs that the algorithm decides to surface to you will be stuff that relies not on understanding of their spoken word, but shock on silly effects, funny faces, annoying sounds, things you may interpret as cringe. In reality, your inability to understand Spanish, Portuguese, or Lithuanian is what served you this content. You're the one at fault here. You're the one who's cringe, not the creator. If you see dumb content, it's because TikTok's For You page reflects what you're smart enough to understand. <laughs> it's not random. The content is driven by you. People read a poorly written listing on Amazon and assume the product must be of poor quality, whereas if they could read it in its original language, they wouldn't see an issue. As is the nature of the place I live, I've been in office situations where coworkers who couldn't understand each other assumed each other were bad at their jobs. I've been on the receiving end of messages like, hey, that dude's English slash French is bad, do you understand what his deal is? The better way to go about this, of course, is to ask for help if you're having difficulty understanding someone, because ultimately, comprehension is on you shift judgment away from the speaker and assign effort to the listener instead. I digress. So what does the myth of comprehensibility have to do with Dongo Adventure? Honestly? Nothing. Or at least, it shouldn't. Accent discrimination is a crappy, weird, smelly form of Western colonialism that has no place in a freaking YouTube game review of all things. Can humor be derived from goofy transliteration? Yeah, sure, as AV Gen has proven. But a piece of art should not be judged solely by its critics' ability to understand its artist's description, abstracted by a layer of translation to a language foreign to them. You want to know the issue here? The problem with Dongo Adventure is that part of its purchase flow encourages you to notice large amounts of text that clearly weren't written in English originally, or if they were, weren't written by a native speaker, whatever that means. A player's first impression of Dongo, before they've even finished buying the game, is that it's created by people with broken English, and judging by their studio, they're probably from Latin America. But re, since when did English become a prerequisite to intelligence, artistry, or getting the technical experience necessary to construct a video game? You think every competent game developer speaks English? Did you like it? No, obviously. And I don't mean to diminish the hurdle that I'm sure, for example, some Japanese game makers must still have breaking into English audiences, but I don't think it's as difficult for them given their culture's contribution to popular media and gaming in particular. I also wouldn't be surprised if a certain amount of East Asian cultural fetishization played a role here. The impression that I get, again, as an outsider, is that there's a surprising amount of folks south of me who've chosen to know a lot more about sake than tequila. Just like non-English TikTokers whose most well-known videos outside of their geographic niche are certified cringe, Dongo isn't Game Nationale's only game. It's not even their only precision platformer. But just like on TikTok, the average viewer or player passes critiques and ridicules without realizing it's more their fault than the creators that they perceive this as being bad or cringe. You're the one who doesn't speak Spanish. You're the one who doesn't speak Portuguese. You're the one who filtered games on the eShop by price lowest to high and bought a $1 game and expected it to be something better. Tie that to the average Western gamer's pre-established biases when it comes to Latin America, and Dongo's met his match. At a disadvantage from day one, poor little mouse didn't stand a chance. Accent bias is a shitty bias to have, but we, particularly monolingual people, need to learn how to recognize and stop having it. 
Thinking the foreign waiter, the foreign call center agent, the foreign Uber driver, or the foreign game developer is dumber than you because they speak English worse than you makes you, and I don't say this lightly, a silly fucking goose. Am I overcomplicating my response to a game called Dongo Adventure? Absolutely. But maybe that's because I'm captivated by this game. Behind its shitty visuals and piss controls lies a precision platformer made by a studio that clearly specializes in them that I think is really interesting. And you know what? I refuse to let you not look past its surface level crud to the pretty, pretty diamond that lies beneath. I guess you could say that I'm caught in a dongo adventure. Mm -hmm.